All right, welcome everyone to our program for this evening, What's in a Name? A Community Conversation on Renaming Arlington's Places and Streets. We are really glad to have you with us here tonight at the Arlington Committee of 100. My name is Hannah Dannenfelser and I'm the chair of the Arlington Committee of 100 and I'm going to be your moderator for this evening. If you're watching us right now on Facebook Live and you think this is something that your friends would like to hear, please consider sharing that Facebook Live to your personal page. To stay in touch with us, you can like and follow our Facebook page. We, publish, we also publish our events through email announcements in addition to those Facebook events, and we'd love to have you continue to join us in the future. I know we may have some new folks to the Committee of 100 this evening and just wanna share who we are. We are an all volunteer organization with a mission to foster open and vigorous discussion of timely community issues. We're focused on providing nonpartisan information on the issues that the issues of the day um, for community members and community leaders. We think that knowledge and education is power and we don't shy away from tough issues because we have a history of bringing you really high quality information and context from top leaders and experts. A heads up to our members, please stay tuned for a communication to come from us regarding next year's officers and annual meeting because of the complexity of voting during the pandemic, we're currently evaluating the best way to go about this. So we'll be following up with more information. So please keep an eye on your email inbox. If you are with us on Zoom here today, you are on our email list. So renaming is an important topic really all around the country as governments, schools, military, businesses, and more come to terms with the impact of history specifically the history of racism in the United States. Communities are taking a look at the meaning of their names and symbols and where they come from. In Arlington, that conversation has been going on for a number of years. Some of you may remember our program back in December, 2017, where we hosted speakers to discuss the name of one of our local high schools. It was an impassioned discussion and an evaluation of our community's values. The school that I actually went to was previously called when I was there Washington Lee High School, but is now known as Washington Liberty High School in order to remove the memorialization of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. I will clarify on, uh, on that note, I'll clarify that our program tonight is covering the naming processes governed by Arlington County government. This is different than the Arlington Public Schools renaming processes, which come under the purview of the Arlington School Board. So for the purposes of keeping our program focused, we are just focusing on those under the county umbrella. With that WNL conversation, the, the conversations didn't stop. And then in September 2020, Arlington County, under the leadership of the county board, announced its intention to change the Arlington logo, which also hailed back to Robert E. Lee. They also announced the intention to create a community-wide process for the evaluation of places and facilities in Arlington. Tonight, you're going to be hearing from one of our county board members, Christian Dorsey, who was integral in that conversation. The first step in the county process is to evaluate our primary symbol, the county logo. The Arlington County Manager has established a county logo review panel to go through that process, and you'll be hearing from J.D. Spain, who is a member of the county logo review panel and also the president of the Arlington NAACP. As we all know, this process requires a historical context to understand where we are today and where we'll be in the future. So we have Cassandra Good joining us. Cassandra is a PhD and assistant professor of history at Marymount University. I do want to acknowledge and thank our program committee led by Delegate Patrick Hope and Jerry Laporte. Our program committee is one of my most interesting meetings that I get to sit in on and Jerry and Patrick guide it with a really strong pulse on the most important issues facing Arlington. Our program for this month was put together by our board member John Weistat, who was really thoughtful in developing what you're going to hear tonight. John actually just joined our Committee 100 board this past year, and he's certainly no stranger to Arlington, so he jumped in head first into our board and program committee. Those of you who know John are not even a little bit surprised by that. Before we do get started, I wanted to make sure you know about our program for next month. Panelists and details are currently to be announced for Can Arlington Solve Missing Male Housing on Its Own? 
You likely have heard many conversations about the issue of missing middle, many, missing middle, excuse me, housing in Arlington, but we're going to take a regional approach in our upcoming program. It's a little different than the tact we usually take with the Arlington Committee of 100, so I'm really excited for this one. Please stay tuned for an invitation in your email inbox. We're pushing out, if you check that chat box, you just saw a registration link go out for Wednesday, May 12th at 7 p.m. We also want to give a big thank you to the Arlington Community Federal Credit Union for being our sponsor for this program year. We have had an incredibly successful year as an organization, and a part of that is due to the credit union coming in to support us as a sponsor so that we could waive membership dues during the pandemic. So thank you very much to the Arlington Credit Union for that partnership and supporting us this year. I also want to welcome some elected officials who uh, we saw joining us today. I I'm going to apologize in advance if I missed you. We're going by the registration list. If you've just joined in, please stick your name in the chat because I would like to be able to thank you for being here. But who we, I know that tonight we have uh, Delegate Patrick Hope from the Virginia House of Delegates. We have Christian, our speaker, Christian Dorsey from the Arlington County Board and Libby Garvey, our, another county board member has joined in with us tonight. We also wanna thank Barbara Cannonin from the school board for the Arlington School Board for being with us tonight. So for our speakers, we're gonna have, we're gonna go in the order of Christian and then Julius and then Cassandra presenting. And then it's gonna be followed by a question and answer period for our audience. If you're with us on Zoom, you can submit questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We will get to as many questions as possible. We have questions that could last hours because we have such a thoughtful and inquisitive group that joins us. So we will not get to them all, but we will get to the one, we'll especially get to the ones that are recurring questions. Um, I do encourage you to keep those questions concise and ask them in the form of a question that will definitely increase the likelihood that we'll be able to uh, include your question in the program. So I'm gonna kick it off to Christian. Christian Dorsey was elected to the county board in 2015, and he was reelected back in 2019 for a second term. He represents Arlington on the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments and is Arlington's member on the Transportation Planning Board. He has a long history of community leadership and civic engagement, but I especially am interested in the fact that he is a former chair of the Arlington Committee of 100. So um, I'm sure he will have lots of tips for me later on how he could have done it much better, but I am just very honored to have him here tonight. And Christian, actually, when I looked at your bio online, I did not realize you used to lead the Bonder and Amanda Johnson Community Development Corporation. They are fantastic. And I was just really happy to see that connection between them and Bridges to Independence because just a really special mission coming together. So great to hear that you're such a big part of that organization. Well, thank you, Hannah. I appreciate the uh, introduction, and I certainly appreciate the introduction to uh, the invitation to be a part of this conversation. So it, 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 it goes without saying that we are in the midst of a national conversation, the likes of which has been long overdue, spurred by incidents of violence against uh, mostly Black and Brown people on the part of law enforcement in various parts of the country. Uh, these incidents, while uh, certainly awakening a new consciousness have not been new to the black and brown communities and it's been a part of our experience for generations. But it's brought to light a broader community conversation that uh, thankfully, uh, if there's any good to be gleaned from them, that recognizes that you can't deal with these incidents as isolated occurrences, but you need a systemic response. And we've been grappling with that in Arlington for more than just over the past year. Uh, if you look at Arlington, we have been on this journey of trying to figure out how our systems contribute to the marginalization and the uh, disparate outcomes that people of color and other marginalized communities face. And we've been on a journey since the early 2000s when we first grappled with what should our articulated mission statement be? where we affirm the importance of each and every individual regardless of background. But of course, it's not just about rhetoric. It also has to be followed up with meaningful action. And over the course of the uh, last couple of decades, there are a number of areas where Arlington has really tried to align its values with systemic changes that produce 
real positive outcomes. They've included making sure that our local law enforcement, for example, doesn't become a tool in the uh, federal effort to marginalize people uh, based on immigration status. It's meant that we have gone about correcting the decades of historic on and under investment in our black communities by ensuring that resources are brought to those communities uh, in a way that is transformative. It has meant that we have prioritized housing so that people who are left behind by uh, not having wealth and assets have an opportunity to live and contribute in our community. And most recently, as part of an effort that I was pleased to lead in 2019, we have reoriented our government to focus on equity. And I can talk at length about that and I won't, but I'll just leave you with a fundamental takeaway of that work on equity. It is the recognition while in our country, we value the principle that majorities rule, it also affirms that minorities matter, period. And when you have that as your framing, you look at everything that you do through a different lens. And certainly in the aftermath of the George Floyd murder in Minneapolis, we had lots of people in our community asking for county government to look at all manner of ways in which historic vestiges of marginalization appear to us each and every day. And we got lots of requests to rename streets and bridges and facilities, and of course, to re-examine our county logo and seal. And as part of re-examining that approach, we looked at how this had been done historically and found out that, you know what? We really didn't have a, a process for considering these things. In some cases, it was ad hoc. We have a process for parks. We have a process, as Hannah mentioned, for schools governed by APS. When it comes to other facilities, we didn't really have a, a clear path forward for how we would consider how they are to be affirmatively named, or in the case that they presented objection, how they would be renamed. And I know this firsthand because in 2019, uh, I led a process that sought uh, the authority and ultimately resulted in the renaming of Jefferson Davis Highway or Route 1 in South Arlington to Richmond Highway. And that was sort of something that we had to make up as we went along. And coming out of all of these experiences came the, the realization that we could do better. We could have a process, we could come up with processes that were clear that involve the community to approach how we, we dealt with our public facilities. And so one of the things that I think is incredibly important in this conversation is that we ultimately are able to do something that is consistent, that, is have, that involves uh, community members in offering their thoughts and perspectives, and that ultimately has accountability to the people that you elect in this community, the county board. So we expect that during the fall of this year, we will have a proposal from our county manager that involves multiple levels of stakeholder input for how we ought to think about this renaming, uh, these renaming issues. And my uh, criteria for a successful process will be that we have a panel of individuals who are diverse, in age, race and ethnicity, tenure in the county, geographic neighborhoods, all of the manner of diversities that you can imagine. We wanna bring those voices to the table to consider naming and renaming requests. We also want this committee to have a long view, to think about what will endure for generations. Because one of the things that I would think would be a failure is if we end up with something that tends to be uh, changed from generation to generation based on uh, the particular sense of the day. We wanna work hard to come up with ways of naming our facilities that will endure. And that ultimately, that there is accountability 
for these decisions. And that best rests with those that you elect, but we wanna have a clear record of why we name things the way we do, what we intend to accomplish and convey with those namings, and that future generations can rely on our good work today to hopefully feel comfort in what they experience in the future. So there's gonna be a lot more that comes with that. And I expect that that will be produced in the fall. But as of right now, we actually have a real world application of these principles. And it comes with the a process that is nearing conclusion to change our county logo and seal. A couple of points of background, and I know Mr. Spain will talk about his involvement in the committee more at length. But the best that we could determine, there was really never any meaningful public role in the creation of the current county logo and seal. And while I know that there are many diverse opinions about uh, the, the logo and the seal, some people like it, they think it's fine. Some people really don't have any opinion. They're not affected by it. We know quite frankly that others are deeply affected by the logo and seal and more importantly, the symbolism that it represents. And certainly there is no arbiter, there is no one arbiter of what a symbol should mean. It's gonna impact different people in different ways. What I hope we can all agree on when it comes to Arlington's logo and seal, it is clearly designed to portray Arlington House. And I hope that we can all agree that Arlington House is a place where Africans were enslaved. And that edifice, that edifice that captured that activity is still in place and stands as a monument to that period. And we also hopefully can agree that over time, that house has been designated as a memorial to Robert E. Lee, who fought to preserve the condition that would allow for the enslavement of Africans. In my opinion, we can do better. And so we have a diverse group of individuals who are working on considering criteria for evaluating new logo submissions. And there have been a great many that have been uh, offered and that they are diligently working to narrow down before ultimately presenting to the public for uh, it to weigh in, and then for ultimately the county board to make a decision on what the new logo and uh, logo for our county should be. So a key part of all of this is that we have community conversation, that we all come along together on this journey. So in closing, I'd just like to thank the Committee of 100 provided for providing a venue for such conversation. And I'll look forward to hearing from the other panelists and will be available if there are any questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, very much. We really appreciate having you here tonight. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to JD. JD is the president of the Arlington branch of the NAACP. And under his leadership, the branch has grown to an all-time high, not only in membership, but especially in influence. I am hearing about the Arlington NAACP all the time. Uh, JD is a key leader in Arlington and a constant advocate for racial justice. So, and under JD's leadership, the Arlington NAACP is holding regular meetings, announcing advocacy positions on a regular basis, participating in community processes and conversations and more. JD has a very long list of accomplishments, but I wanna especially congratulate him for one recent one. I saw that he received fairly recent, relatively recent, uh, the 2020 FBI Director's Community Leadership Award from the agency's Washington field office. So congrats JD, that's very exciting. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, and hello to everyone and thank you to the Arlington Committee of 100 for this invitation to be with you uh, this evening, and also uh, it's great to be among good company to our elected official, Christian Dorsey, and to our good friend, Dr. Kay Cassie Good. Uh, thank you for serving on the panel. And to another one of my good friends, uh, John Bystad, who extended the invitation on behalf of Arlington Committee 100 for me to be here. So let's make it, you know, up front. I'm not a historian and I'm not an elected official, but I am the president of the oldest and boldest civil rights organization in America. 
and that's your local branch of the NAACP. Uh, and before I go into the slide, I will talk a little bit about, so yes, I was one of the 15 selected to serve on the panel, uh, the logo review panel, and I'm not gonna sit here and get in, in ahead of them, but I will tell you that we've received over 250 submissions and uh, they've been very creative and we've been hard at work. So uh, you will find out here uh, very soon, I think we're gonna put something up publicly of our final five for the community to uh, look at, review, make some comments on, but I'm thoroughly impressed not only by the diversity of the committee, but also the commitment uh, and willingness to serve and volunteer. So it's been a pleasure and a lot of, a lot of long nights working on that. So more to come. So I'll go through uh, my slide presentation here. Uh, <clears throat> I was asked if I could brief one up. So uh, here we go. Um, make no mistake about it. Uh, what Christian Dorsey talked about a few minutes ago, this is not new to us. And it's not new to the NAACP. So I'm gonna kind of target my conversation about this logo and, and what we're doing and what lens I look through as a leader of the Arlington NAACP in an area below the Mason-Dixon line, right? Uh, so birth of the nation back in 1915, that's how long the NAACP, who came into existence in 1909, has been fighting against you know, symbols uh, that represent the Confederacy and its defenders. Not too long ago, back in 2017, our current president and CEO, Derek Johnson, he even spoke out condemning Confederate uh, symbols. This is what he said. I'll give you a chance to look at that. But what I wanna leave you with, something I highlighted here, anything that sought to devalue, diminish, uh, and profit off the suffering of black citizens, I don't think it needs to be uplifted and it should not be uplifted, you know? There is a place, I strongly believe, for history, whether that's in our textbooks, as our chairman talked about, in our museums, in our libraries. But what you will also find out here as I move forward in the slide presentation, here, here in Virginia, the birthplace of Robert E. Lee, which has the highest density of Confederate symbols, you know, we still have a lot of work to do. The Southern Poverty Law Center, and this is just a snapshot as of yesterday, public symbols of the Confederacy alone, and they're, they're tracking this. As you will see in the Southeastern portion of the United States, this is where you will find a lot of these public symbols, the Stonewall Jacksons, the Jeffersons, the Lees, predominantly in these areas. Why is that? You know, a, a little while ago, a few months back, the Arlington branch of the NAACP, we met with a Dr. Lyra, Lyra Montero. She's a esteemed professor up in Rutgers University because we wanted to get an understanding as well about uh, not just that logo, but talk to us a little bit about columns and power structures, and white marble, right? Uh, I'm going to share this brief with everyone on the call later on, but I found out some very interesting things from the call, from that uh, conversation. If you look uh, attentively at this uh, rally flag, I mean, uh, this, this flyer that was used back in 2017, what you'll denote in there is that the bottom portion of it, there are some symbols of, of some individuals, places uh, here in Virginia that was used in their flyers, right? these white supremacists and all right folks to rally. So, you know, and, and why were they doing that? Because there's something about the Confederacy. There's something about that time that charges them up. Also the Southern Poverty Law Center, right? We, we're not gonna talk much about schools, but this is also some history, right? We, we all know what happened, you know, shortly after the Brown v. Board of Education uh, when it was deemed that the segregated schools uh, were unconstitutional. So, you know, shortly after that time, and this is well documented, what we saw across America, more especially in the South, is that we saw buildings, schools, all of those things starting to be renamed of Confederate generals, Confederate places. It's been around for a while, y'all. So the NAACP, this is what we say about Confederacy. Heritage, when heritage means hate, and I've highlighted some portions here. So you can take a second to look at that. 
we understand that some people defend them as an innocent representation of their American heritage. Mm -hmm. But at the NAACP, we also know that these symbols glorify treason and a hateful history of white supremacy and black subjugation. So the NAACP is not immune from any of the, uh, you know, people saying, hey, what about the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People? I did some research and went back a little. Even back in 2016, someone started a petition and changed our org and said, you know what? The name NAACP itself is uh, offensive. It only garnered 30 some odd, I guess, petitioners who signed it, supporters. But even we at the NAACP have come under attack for our name. The logo that the Honorable Christian Dorsey talked about. Um, it's been 67 years, my friends, since Brown versus Board of Education. It shouldn't have taken 67 years, nor should it have taken, in my opinion, the Arlington branch of the NAACP and allies to make this right here happen. We know it's on the record it, that people knew that that lump, that logo, the symbol, affected them in ways that is unimaginable. It was shared with leaders of our government, yet no one did anything about it. But I applaud where we're at today. We're moving forward. We're going to be better off, I believe, in the future because that flag, that logo, whatever it may be, will be more reflective of the Arlington today. It may have some remnants of the past, but definitely project the Arlington for tomorrow. Late breaking news, right? We're still going through things here in Arlington. Not too long ago, uh, over in Westover, right? Um, there was a suggestion that uh, the name of school, the old Reed School over Westover. And I watched that happen. And I know this, we're not talking about school board, but how is it, my friends, that a community, right, can come together and say, you know what, we want to name the school Westover. Did they do the history about Westover and Westover Plantation, the enslavement and all of those things? I applaud the school board for their efforts. But this is a statement from our chair of the school board. We still have work to do. So Arlington can make this happen, just like we did over in DC. Uh, the county manager had talked about, uh, we're gonna move forward on some type of uh, work group, getting a diverse group of individuals in the room. Uh, but DC just went through this and they, they put out the report not too long ago. It was called the DC Faces Working Group. So if you get some time, go and look at what they did. Uh, but they're doing something, they did something that I believe where we're heading in Arlington is where we're gonna review uh, legacy namesakes, um, including buildings, parks, public places, spaces, um, and bring that back to the board. I'm gonna leave you with this. Good lady, Mary Angelo, <clears throat> Civil Rights Act. I have great respect for the past. If you don't know where you've come from, you don't know where you're going. I have respect for the past, but I'm, in a, I'm a person of the moment. I'm here and I do my best to completely center at the place I am at. Then I go forward to the next place. My friends on the call, I, I think we have a, a, a very brief time uh, right now in this moment in history to really look at and reevaluate buildings, streets, names, um, and having really some tough discussions about does that represent the Arlington that we currently live in? You know, I've, I've watched throughout Virginia through many branches of the NAACP and some of their engagements in, in some areas where, you know, they were fighting tooth and nail to try to change elementary schools from, from Stonewall Jackson, but they were successful, them and their allies. There's a reason certain names were put in place. There were a reason. Um, and so it's up to us if we're going to make a decision whether that should can be continued or should we move forward. I'm, I, again, I am, I, I'm not a historian, but I believe wholeheartedly that um, now is the time as a community for us to come together, have these conversations. We understand COVID's here. 
That's that's the priority. But we also got to look at names, buildings, roads, highways. So we're going to continue here at the NAACP to uh, work with our allies and with elected leadership uh, in this regard. And uh, we're open to, to having conversations with anyone in the community. There's a lot of work to be done. And I look forward here tonight uh, to entertaining and answering any questions that you may have. So thank you, Hannah. Great, thank you very much, JD. All right, I'm going to pass it off here to Cassandra Good. Cassandra is an assistant professor of history at Marymount University. She received her PhD in history from the University of Pennsylvania and her bachelor's and master's degrees are in American studies right over the river in George, at George Washington University. Her area of expertise is late 18th and through 19th century America with a particular focus on politics, gender and cultural history. She's an award-winning author of Founding Friendships, which is about relationships between men and women in the early American Republic. I love the sound of that. I added it to my Goodreads reading list. Um, I encourage you to take a look. I read the description and it sounds really fantastic. So I'm looking forward to reading it. She's currently working on another book titled First Family, George Washington's Heirs and the Making of America. The book tells the story of Washington's step-grandchildren, the Custises, who achieved fame as the nation's first first family. Through the research for first family, She's working with local historic sites and she's done extensive research on enslaved people at the Arlington House. Cassandra, I'd love to hear when that book is published as well so I can pick up a copy. So I'll pass it off to you here. Thank you very much and thanks for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here and um, talk about these issues. And interestingly, in my um, history of the Civil War class today, we actually had a lively discussion of this topic. So you know, I will integrate some of what I heard from my students today. And part of why I have said on my first slide here that this is one historian's perspective. The historians in my Civil War history class had a lot of very different opinions about what we should do about renaming um, after learning about the Civil War in particular. So I wanna just start out by distinguishing some terms here. Um, JD brought up the term heritage, which is often used um, by people who are still you know, into the idea of Confederate heritage. So we need to distinguish here, when we're talking about history, we're talking about analysis, uh, interpretation, and reconstruction of the past based upon research and evidence. Memory and heritage can often be used interchangeably, uh, although memory is more of a subset of heritage in certain ways. Memory is recollections, um, rather individual or collective of what has occurred. While well, heritage is more about people's inheritance of something from the past used for contemporary purposes, uh, draws on memories. It usually has a positive view of the past. And that's where often that heritage term comes up with the Confederacy again. Now, all of these are necessarily selective and they are political. And I don't mean partisan, but political. There are power interests at stake in any of these. But I will say that history ideally is based more on reason and evidence, whereas memory and heritage are based more on emotional ties. Um, so I want to now just dive for a moment into Arlington's history of street names, because if we want to actually look at the history here of how we got the names we have versus what our memories of them are or how we feel about it, uh, there, there is a history here. Uh, it's not a very old history. So in the 1930s, the county um, streets were a mess. And so they needed to revamp the street names. They had a commission created in 1932 of Arlington residents. And from what I can tell, every single one of them was white. I haven't been able to confirm that, but I looked in the census and found most of them. There were local groups that made suggestions and the committee itself asked the Virginia Historical Society for a list of names of people from Virginia of historical significance and apparently never got an answer. And interestingly, in this process of renaming, several historical figures um, lost their streets. So in fact, so there was a directory at one point. So we used to have a Lafayette street. Interestingly, Lafayette was a big anti-slavery activist. Uh, and we used to have a Hamilton street. We also used to have a Pocahontas street. Um, so, you know, this was in the 30s. 
names change. And I don't think we need to expect that they're going to last forever. Um, certainly there are logistical concerns and we'd like them to last for a long time, but um, you know, these are not eternal things. And it's interesting to note too, that the point at which this street name rationalization happened was an era of white gentrification and increasing discrimination and segregation against African-Americans in Arlington. And you're seeing images of um, African-American dwellings in what is now Roslyn. And this information I'm sharing is from scholar Lindsay Bet Better Brucci's uh, 2017 dissertation, which I can put a link in the chat later because it's online and it's very interesting. And what she's explaining that happens in this period between 1900 and 1930 the black population of Arlington goes way down. Uh, it goes from 38% to 12% as white suburbanites move in. Official county policy started enforcing racial segregation in housing through zoning, um, including zoning against multifamily housing. In 1930, several black candidates ran for county government. Um, whites in the county in return switched the government to a countywide rather than district separated elections for our county board and added a county manager. Um, so in fact, the system we currently have for our county governance came out of a desire to exclude uh, African-Americans in Arlington from being part of government and an African-American candidate did not run for county office for 50 years after that. This is also a time when the KKK was prominent in Arlington and was using violence to keep African Americans from voting. So I think it's important to understand when we look at, okay, who's involved when we were getting the names of our streets. Um, many of these streets have been named before this time too, but this decision-making process was happening at a time when African Americans were not just marginalized in Arlington, but actively discriminated against and um, suffering from violence. So that's sort of a very quick snapshot of some history of the sort of what's going on in Arlington around naming of streets. And so I wanna to move to thinking about what are the considerations um, when we're thinking about naming? So a couple of myths that I wanna uh, sort of dispel here. First of all, the idea that you're erasing history. Um, I think JD mentioned like, there are people that are fine having our textbooks. That doesn't mean we need a street or a monument. People are not going to forget who Robert E. Lee was if there's not a street named after him or his monument there. He's definitely in the textbooks and not going anywhere. On the other hand, there are people that say renaming is pointless and it is worth acknowledging. And one of my students pointed this out in class today. Yeah, that's fine to rename, but are, are you going to address the structural inequalities, right? So renaming alone is not that helpful. It needs to be done in conjunction with larger changes. And finally, renaming is always the answer. Um, if any of you read about what happened in San Francisco with their committee to rename schools, that's sort of an example of how not to go about this. Um, people are complicated and there are going to be historic figures that, it is, that it's not a clear cut answer, um, especially when we think about people outside of the Confederacy and the Civil War era. There's some other you know, there's discussions about in San Francisco, they were going to rename schools named after Lincoln and Washington and Dianne Feinstein. Uh, we have to remember that um, many people who did good things also did bad things. And so we need a careful historical process uh, to think about how to weigh those things. So I just wanna suggest some principles and um, questions to ask as the county thinks about this process. So first principles, who are the voices in the room? Um, obviously people of color, um, African-Americans in particular in this county, but also Latinx people um, may not be the majority. This, you know, clearly African-Americans are in the minority in this county. And so as Christian mentioned, if you, that majorities might rule, but minorities matter. And that means that in some cases, certain voices need to matter more. And I think that the voices of people who have historically been marginalized and who are most impacted by these names those voices need to matter more than the voices of somebody like me who is white. Um, 
And so I think that's an important thing for us to consider. Uh, community values. I think part of this process when we think about renaming has to be a discussion about what the values of this community are and what messages we want to promote in Arlington. You can't decide whether a name um, or a monument reflects your community's values if you haven't figured out exactly what they are. And finally, historical expertise. That example I gave you from San Francisco, they did research on Wikipedia, um, which is not always correct. And there were no professional historians involved. So as a professional historian, I'm here to say you should have professional historians involved uh, in this process. Some questions to consider, and these are adapted from universities who have gone through the renaming process and often have historians involved in this. If you're looking at a name, is this person's principal legacy fundamentally at odds with the community's values? Was the relevant principal legacy significantly contested in the time and place in which the namesake lived? Was this name originally chosen to honor somebody for reasons at odds with the community's, oh, and that should say values, not offers? And did the namesake make major contributions to the community? I mean, for universities, for instance, this is important if it's an alum, um, if it's somebody who contributed to that university. And the same thing could be true in Arlington. If it's somebody who made some particular contribution to this community, that's worth considering. So finally, just um, some larger principles and thoughts about how this process should work. Um, again, I think this needs to be based on thorough research, not just sort of people's memories or ideas about heritage. Needs to consider the diversity of the community as Christian talked about bringing in people um, who represent different groups. The naming should be relevant to the location. And finally, there, need to be, there needs to be outreach to stakeholders, including if we're going to name something after a current day figure, um, outreach to that person or that person's family. So I think I have sped through my 10 minutes. Sorry to talk quickly here, but I am happy to answer any further questions. Wonderful, thank you, Cassandra. We're having everybody come back for the Q and A. Um, I just love the Committee of Women. <laughs> I have to say, we, um, I was recruited into the Committee of 100 uh, on the idea that this is really the place where tough conversations happen and they happen really respectfully and with information. Uh, someone the other day, when I was talking to him, said, we are the anti-Twitter, anything that is, and as a, as a twit myself, I'm all over Twitter. I am, over, this is the over 280 characters. This is really the substance and the content that we get into that's really important. Um, Cassandra, a lot of that I was very new to me and I um, really wanna learn a lot more about that. So I really appreciate y'all being here tonight. So we're gonna go to the Q and A. We do have um, a couple questions that I'm not gonna filter out because I wanna, be a, a venue where we can have tough conversations with respect. So I am gonna ask a couple of the tougher questions here. Um, it's a mix, some people, it, it's, it's a whole mixed bag. So I'm gonna start with, has any survey, I, I think this is regarding um, the street names, has any survey research been done as to testing, into testing the names and what gives Arlington a more positive and favorable image? I'm thinking that that means, that's from Michael. I'm thinking that that means outside of Arlington, what is the, the perception of people outside of Arlington, how that makes us look. I'm not, I have to say, I kind of understood it when I first read it and I'm a little unclear the second time I read it. So. Um, well, I'm not sure if this is responsive. I'll just give a, a crack at something we've tried. So, um, you know, with the, uh, support of the county board, we had a, uh, a group that works in the Lee Highway corridor that sought to bring together community voices to um, seek perspectives and alternatives on uh, the name for Lee Highway. And as part of their work, uh, they not only brought together a big, broad uh, working group of people, but they also um, deployed a community wide sur or a neighborhood wide survey of people who were in and around the Lee Highway corridor produced, uh, I can't remember offhand, um, JD, I don't know if you remember, but uh, thousands, I believe, of responses. Yeah. 
And, and, and that's the sort of thing, it, it's one useful tool to, uh, to, to really gather that input. But I think, you know, what Cassie talked about, that's also no substitute for having real deliberative work of people who are um, diverse in composition and really committed to the effort, guided by and, in, and, and supported by actual historians. Um, but then, of course, you take that byproduct and there's no reason, and I would wholly endorse that you, you get perspectives from as broad a uh, group of people as you possibly can. Thank you. So are names of plantations offensive? And this is a part, a two part question. If the names of plantations are offensive, should Arlington itself be renamed? That's from Charles is asking that. So I, I don't mind jumping in on this one and I'm sure because that question has come to the NAACP uh, a lot last year. Uh, I think when we're, we're talking about changing the name of Arlington, um, it may come a point in time where we need to have that conversation. Um, but Arlington in itself, again, is, is who we are. It is our history. Is it good? Is it perfect? No. But I will believe that changing the name of a county, i.e. Arlington, is a pretty heavy lift and will require extensive dialogues uh, in the community and leadership. So not ruling anything out, uh, but it's something we may have to consider in the future. Yeah, and, you know, that's an interesting question that uh, <laughs> Charlie and I have emailed about this before. Um, and I think you know, it depends what principles we're working off of, but some of the same principles that would apply to logo would apply to that name. But again, if we look logistically, as as JD is saying, it that's a much bigger change. I mean, there's even discussion about the use of the term plantation at this point um, among historians and activists, and whether that adequately captures the history. So. You know, I think, and often the question with these is, well, if you rename this, where do you stop? And I don't think that is a reason to avoid the conversation. If I could just add briefly, I think that's why the criteria that, you know, Cassie talked about, which, you know, look very good to me. I'm sorry, Dr. Good, uh, look very good to me. Um, I think leads you to an answer to that very fundamental question. Uh, it's not about just simply um, you know, something is or was a product of a certain time or done in a certain way, therefore it's bad and therefore we move on. We actually have a deliberative way to consider um, what are the principal legacies? What are the principal ways that uh, people uh, viewed it at the time, uh, live under it today? Those are all considerations that go into what your ultimate answer to the question is. So it's not just simply, it's a product of a terrible time in this country. Therefore, it goes away because one of the things that we all have to embrace and confront about being a, being Americans, and I am a proud American, uh, but that the roots of uh, settling of this country and the way that it's been settled has been born on the backs of genocide against indigenous people, enslavement of African Americans, and if we take a really knee jerk uh, reaction, then it's a uh, poisonous fruit of the entire tree, and we reject the whole thing. And I don't think that that's uh, certainly not where I am. And I certainly don't think that that's how we move our community forward. Anna, may I, may I add something real quick? Uh, and I just want to kind of circle back to something uh, the Honorable Christian Dorsey talked about it about forced processes, right, to a certain extent. So I sat on the Lee Highway Working Group. And I will say, and, and this is a testament to the leadership in the county and more especially to the county manager and where we're heading. That was a very thorough uh, and very open uh, extended process by which we had significant community involvement. So for those that may be looking, I mean, I, I had the pleasure again to sit on that committee or work group, and I'm also sitting on the, the local work group with many other outstanding volunteers in our community. So both of those at least have been phenomenal and um, very transparent. Bernie asks if, do you have concerns that the renamings that are amenable to some groups will likely, could potentially lead to backlashes from other groups? And he's specifically citing the example of boycotts of businesses. Do you have any concerns about that? Oh, you, you, want, you want me to answer that? Yeah. I can't. Yeah, so uh, to, to my, my good friend, Bernie Byrne, um, 
No, I, I do not believe here in Arlington that this, you know, this progressive city, uh, a county, and we're charting a way forward, uh, that it will result in what we do in any way, shape, or form to some type of outcry or backlash. What I am concerned about as a leader, though, is just uh, what we're hearing a lot about now is this council culture, right? Which is a negative connotation. I mean, we have to learn as a community and as a people to respect each other's opinion, right? We may differ, right? But that doesn't mean I want to come down and shut down Arlington. There are some things, as we talked about earlier, in our history, our dark history, that were just wrong, right? A lot of this has happened in the past 50, 60 years. We have a, a time now where we can change that. And that's all we're talking about. Uh, but I don't believe the answer is Mr. Burns' question that we'll be, you know, boycotting and, and rioting and all that. I think that's a little bit extreme, my friend. I, I don't see that happening. Well, and I just want to jump in there and say that, particularly when we're thinking about, you know, who is going to be offended? Is it a person who comes from um, a status uh, in the majority with power already? Um, you know, yeah, it offended a lot of white people in the South when Brown versus Board of Ed came out. That doesn't mean that desegregating schools was wrong. Um, you know, sometimes to follow values and promote social justice, some people are going to be offended by that. Christian, do you have anything to add? Uh, really, I think it's been said very well. Um, you know, at some point you, you actually have to stand for something and what we have done for very long in our community and in our country for sure is to allow the uh, preferences and whims of some to take precedence over uh, the deep-seated hurt caused to others. And uh, that's untenable. Um, there may be people who have no issue with what something is named or even slightly prefer that it continue to be named that, but that cannot exist as predominant over something that leads someone to live under marginalization and feeling like they are not fully a part of this community. Those are not equal and should not be treated the same. And so I'm not looking to cater to convenience or mild preference if it means maintaining something that causes deep hurt and offense. Great. Peter is asking, what's your opinion about the issue of naming places after living people? Cassandra, you started to speak to that. I heard you mentioned Diane Feinstein. Um, did, I wanna see if it, would any of you like to expand on that a little bit? It, yeah, you know, this is something that uh, I think my good friend and activist with NAACP here too, Jill DeWitt is here and we were talking about this because you know there's some historians like David Blight that's a historian of civil war and memory who says, just stop naming stuff after people because all people are complicated and fraught and nobody's perfect. The problem as Jill rightly pointed out to me in our conversation was, well, then the only names you're going to have left are the existing people who are mostly white men. So what I would say is that I would certainly have a preference towards non-name, <laughs> um, you know, non-people related names, but that there still need to be some. And you know, whether that's somebody recently deceased or somebody, um, you know, who is still alive. Hey, go ahead, Christian. Uh, I'm speaking just as an individual who's who's actually thought about this quite a lot. And, um, you know, a thought exercise that I had with another uh, leader in the county who I won't name, um, you know, concerned our 1930s conventions of naming lots of our streets after presidents, regardless of whether or not they made a significant or positive contribution to, you know, our national history or not. And, you know, therefore, as we look forward in the future, what does that mean when it comes to um, evaluation of our former, most recent president, Donald Trump, and um, our pre prior president, Barack Obama? And one of the things that I thought, you know, I actually regret that our current conventions about naming preclude us from considering naming a street after Barack Obama. Now, hang with me for a minute. Regardless of what your feeling is about his politics or his presidency, he will always be the first non-white man to be elected president of the United States. I can think of few other things that are worthy of 
honorifics of public facilities all across this country. Yet I know, I know that that's going to engender intense debate. So, you know, ultimately I think we do ourselves well if we can think beyond just simply individuals, but at the same time, there are gonna be individuals in our future that we will desire to honor with public facilities. And I would hate to, to lose that entirely. Right. JD, were you about to say something? Yeah, no, I, I think I'm on, on those same lines that, you know, we went through this in the League Highway Working Group with, with names and we had some criteria set forth. So I would, I would really kind of take a pause and, and carefully reevaluate or evaluate a, a living person being named uh, for a number of reasons that we probably need to have time to get into right now. But because I think when you start peeling the peeling back a little bit on anyone, right, you're going to find something there that people may not agree with. So I think we have a plethora of, of names and so things we can go after and, and name. So I, I am not right now one of living at least uh, individuals being named. Well, thank you all so much. We really appreciate having you here. For our audience, I'm gonna ask you to stick around with us for just about two more minutes. Um, one thing I just realized, JD, I think there was a link during your presentation. I knew you were gonna stick in the chat. Um, I, I'm trying to remember which which link that was. Would you mind? Yeah, that so I was going. Yeah, I was going to give the link my brief here, but it's not yeah. allowing me. Let me see here if I can do it. If it doesn't work, if you want to send it in a direct message in the chat to the Committee of 100, and then Scott can send that out too. I just want to when I sure. just shared the dissertation I was talking about that I, and that I also want to just mention since somebody in the chat, um, Nadia Conyer said she's here as a descendant of the um, Parks and Gray family uh, who were enslaved at Arlington House. And I really should have mentioned that yeah. that would be a perfect kind of stakeholder to be part of conversations about the name Arlington or the logo. Certainly, we're lucky enough to still have descendants in this community um, from that period. And I have been excited to meet some of them. Nadia, I hope I get to meet you um, as some of the work I'm doing with Arlington House this spring. I'll just say, Nadia, if, if you would like me to make an e-intro to Cassandra, I'm happy to do that. Please go on to our website and find our Committee of 100 email address, shoot an email, and we will connect the two of you. Nadia, especially, thank you for being with us here tonight. It's really, really an honor to have you. So thank you very much. So um, we've got, let me see, did that chat go out? Yes, good, wonderful. I see the one for your dissertation and then JD, were you able to send that to Yeah, I'm, try, I'm trying to get it here. Okay. To, well, while you're doing I that, I'm just going to remind you. So I had, a, I just, I emailed it to you because the only feature that I'm getting right now is save chat. When I go okay. all down to the tip and something's not right here. So, hey, I emailed it to you just now. Go ahead. If, there, if folks who are wanting to see that, um, that from JD, give me just one minute. I'll put that in the chat in about a minute and a half. So just hang on for just a sec and I will send that out. Uh, do. I do want to go ahead and remind everyone before you leave to register for our program next month, we're going to be discussing missing middle housing. We're taking a regional approach, which is going to be really cool and probably different from some of the other missing middle programs you may have seen over the last year or two. Um, we are fleshing out some of the details, so stay tuned for our email coming out. It will be at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, May 12th. Please join us. Thank you again to Christian and Julius and Cassandra. This was really fantastic. If you enjoyed this program and you have other folks you know who would like to see it, please consider sharing the Facebook Live um, onto your personal Facebook page. So there it, it is recording there. You will also be able to later within the next couple of days, we are an all volunteer organization. So I'm gonna not make a commitment on the amount of time, but within the next couple of days, the video will be up on our Arlington Committee of 100 website that you can go back and watch it. So please bear with me for just, if you need to hop off, you can hop off, but I'm gonna send that, um, that link from JD to make sure we get it out to y'all who would like to read it. I definitely wanna read it. So give me just a moment, we'll give you some tech. Thanks again, everybody. Um, I think I have to download it, JD. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a PDF. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Yeah, it's not a let me do that. I'll stick around to you. Yeah.
All right. Uh, Christian and uh, Cassandra, it was a pleasure being with you tonight. So thank you. Likewise. Really appreciate yeah, it. Absolutely. It was a great conversation. Yeah, yeah Cassie, um, can I uh, get a copy of your, your criteria that you? Oh, yeah. And you know what? I basically adapted those right from, I'll send you the links also to the university's renamings okay. uh, strategies that I looked at. And I'm curious. I don't know, JD shared the DC one. I don't know if they had a similar principles thing set out. Yeah, so they have a pretty extended, extensive uh, report out, um, this, this PDF. They have closed down, closed out the work group. So the website, but they still have the, uh, the report out there of what they did. It's about, okay, here we go. Yeah. Does it have like their criteria? Yeah, some of it in there. Great. It's 90 some pages. Yeah. All right. But you know, I have to apologize. This, I'm not sure if I'm going to be, I don't know if I have the Zoom skills to put the PDF in. Are you, oh, are you serious? <laughs> I'm sorry, JD. <laughs> you know, is it on your web, is it on your website? Uh, oof, For the NAACP, can we point we people can, to the NAACP website? Yeah, we can do that. We can have it put out there. Okay, uh, great. So take a look at the NAACP Arlington website and that will be up there. So, all right, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. I know we went over a couple minutes to chat longer than we usually do. Thanks again, y'all. This was a really good time. I hope you have a good night. Night. Bye.